Okay. Uh, good morning to everybody. This is Lee Larimer. Good morning. <laughs> and I'm Mark Schwartz. And I'll give you a brief introduction and then we're going to get started. What we do in this is we don't sort of lecture at you in a typical kind of way. This is sort of Lee and I having breakfast and um, talking to each other and trying to learn from one another. And we don't know what we're going to say. And it'd be kind of fun because what we might do is contradict each other. Lee comes from a background of more object relations and self psychology, which is really at the core of attachment theory. I come from the area of trauma and dissociative disorders. Lee is a specialist in chemical dependency. Um, my background is more in sex addiction and eating disorder. And so we kind of are continually learning from one another uh, because in our program, we have one subgroup of clients who have eating disorder, another that have um, chemical dependency, and then we have a mental health section, poetry, a lot of bipolar disorder. So we're seeing the intersection of the three. And so um, what we want to talk about in this part two, we really never got down to the actual core of of treating attachment issues and what an attachment focus is in treatment, which I think is heavily related to dealing with the development of the core self. And so many of the clients with addiction have feel like they're imposters and have a false self. And, you know, the $50 million question is, you know, how does one develop the real self? And you can think of people like Masterson and their work in self psychology, or even Kohut and Winnicott. And, you know, they had so much more to say about this than just about anyone. So, trying to integrate that into our contemporary thinking is what today is going to be about. Okay, so where we left off about what is disorganized attachment, what is, you know, this addictive behavior, and why we're using the lens of attachment theory, and what's unique about that. And where we are is we're talking now about internal working models and dissociation, which is a blending together of Bowlby's original work with some of the contemporary work on trauma and dissociation. The core of what we're going to be talking about then is that there's the addictive behavior and then there's the problem underneath the addictive behavior. And so a lot of therapies are oriented towards 12-step cognitive behavioral relapse prevention and believe that if you can get somebody sober that they've done effective treatment. Or if you're treating PTSD, you think that if you can get the numbing, intrusion, hyperarousal symptoms under control, you know, on a scale of PTSD, then you've done effective treatment. And, you know, over the years of doing this work, what I've discovered is, is that that's necessary, but not sufficient. And that's why so many people relapse. And so in the stage approach, what you're asking yourself is, okay, now the person's sober, what's next? And that's where you need the lens of attachment theory. Because the question is, you know, what is the problem you're treating? And um, what is the goal of treatment? And how do you know when a person has been treated effectively? And only when you begin to see it through the lens of attachment theory does that get clear to me. There All right, go. so this is where we left off. And I just wanted to use this as a pivotal slide to start the lecture, which is that, um, you know, a lot of places say they do trauma therapy. And when I talk to the therapist, I ask them what they're calling trauma therapy. And um, I find that they, they a lot of people think trauma therapy is talking about the trauma and um I, I think that the research data shows that people don't get better just by talking about the trauma and it's necessary oftentimes but not sufficient but if you think of exposure-based therapy the idea is to expose the person to it over and over and over again and maybe then they'll become less hyper aroused so how do you know you're doing effective trauma therapy, which is you know, necessary in, in the work with attachment and addiction? And 
you know, at some point along the way, we'll probably look in the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex, and be able to see if it lights up in order to be able to do that. I remember when Marilyn Cloitra did this beautiful, elegant study where she compared people who did exposure-based therapy versus attachment-based therapy and <clears throat> did uh, scans of people's brain afterwards. And the people who did exposure therapy um, did get better and there were changes in the brain, but the hippocampus still was lighting up bright red. But the people who did attachment-based therapy plus exposure therapy, their brains were <clears throat> did not light up red at all. And so you could see that there was a superiority of the combination of attachment-based therapy with the exposure therapy. And it was just elegant and beautiful model of how we're thinking about this. I just wanna say two things about trauma therapy and then we're gonna really move on to attachment work. That, that one of the critical features is that a person becomes stuck in the trauma. And Marty Horowitz would talk about stress response syndromes and people who get stuck in not being able to work through the whole cycle of stress response. And um, so the, a lot of the therapies became cognitive behaviorally based. And so uh, you, in this cognitive reprocessing therapy, for example, Pat Riesig, what she added to the exposure base is that one has to begin to look at the cognitions that cause a person to get stuck in the trauma. It's my fault, bad, um, and uh, I'm unlovable. And what was missing from even the, the, the cognitive reprocessing therapy was the full understanding of affect and the need for affect-based therapies to be able to change some of these stuck points. Just other examples. So yes, there has to be a cognitive reprocessing. You know, when someone says other people were killed because I messed up, one has to begin to challenge some of those belief systems. And that's necessary, but again, not sufficient. Why? Because the stuck point has more to do with the attachment system than it does with the PTSD. Why is this, of all the people who went through that trauma, stuck in it in certain ways? And you can think of it in terms of EMDR. What <clears throat> in the discussions of EMDR, there was always this idea that there are channels of trauma. And the reason why trauma doesn't get resolved is that when you work in one channel, it oftentimes flows into the channel underneath it and the channel underneath that. Now, if you think of that idea with EMDR, then the reason why a person is stuck with believing I'm unlovable because they were raped has something to do with the early attachment system and the affect that is still uh, tied into that in certain ways. So for example, just so it becomes less esoteric, one client that I'm treating uh, after she was raped, she started drinking and the drinking uh, got to the point of toxicity and it lasted for years. And when I began to process the rape with her, there was not only all these stuck points that began to manifest us, I'm unlovable, I'm bad, I should have done this, it's my fault, which would have been cognitive reprocessing. But all that was affectively tied to tremendous amount of neglect and abuse between her and her caretakers in early childhood. And until I could get to that lower channel of the attachment and the complex trauma uh, from early life and the most of all the affect tied to it, I couldn't really deal with the stuck points in some way. So, what I'm trying to say just succinctly is, is that cognitive-based therapies are necessary, but oftentimes not sufficient because they don't tap into the complex trauma underneath the PTSD trauma or the level of affect tied into feeling like I'm bad, I'm defective, I'm a horrible person because my mom didn't love me. Go, go back to slide 23, the previous slide. I wanted to go back because I think this is a, a really important slide, uh, not only in terms of what we see in working with trauma, 
but if we if we pull back a little bit, it also these are the same issues you see uh, with attachment problems, uh, and they're the same or similar issues that you see uh, with addiction, um, and they all reflect uh, a, a disorder of self and the inability to self-regulate. And if you walk away with anything from last time or this time, that's the that's the essence of. Uh, all three of these these disorders um, is that it's the overall lack of ability to regulate internal experience. And what an attachment-based approach does is it begins to turn that around. It's a developmental arrest. Uh, and it begins to turn that around uh, and restart, uh, for want of a better term, a normal developmental process with the self. Uh, and reflecting on the on the on the slide uh, we showed initially of, of brain function, um, all three of these disorders. Uh, one of the things we've come to understand is when you're working with these patients, you're not necessarily working with a highly verbal and with a highly uh, verbally mediated uh, modality. Uh, you really are making a shift to uh, behaviors that reflect more kind of limbic, limbic, limbic based uh, functioning. And so it's limbic system to limbic system when we do when we're doing this therapy. Uh, and the primary way you can begin to access that is, uh, as Mark indicated uh, before, is through affect. Affect becomes the trailhead that leads us to, uh, for example, stuck points. And then we're be able to begin to do the reprocessing necessary and the reparative work necessary to begin to eliminate these stuck points. So just to summarize, and because we're gonna move away from trauma, that talking about what happened doesn't necessarily process or metabolize memory. And two, that narrative retelling over and over again can be useful, but it also risks autonomic dysregulation and re-traumatization. And of course, that's what the field has been really focused on is not causing any harm. And so what does processing memory refer to? And you know what Laurie always says, it's a matter of, of digesting and excreting. And that somehow that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have over attention to the narrative. But instead, what we're looking for is more of an affective based experience and to understand the origins of that affect and mastery of that uh, as they elicit these strong emotions. And so, you know, when you are working with the rape trauma, for example, and the person says, I know I'm bad and I'm never going to be okay and it's always my fault these are childlike attributions that are strong affectively based that are indelibly written into the brain and are about what happened when you were age five that is now being projected onto what happened to you at age 20 and so you have to do the resolution of the five-year-old experience before you can get resolution of the 20-year-old experience and that's trauma work you know, I spent 10 years in a dissociative disorders unit, and I swear it was the best training I ever had because understanding dissociation, you know, is such an important area that is left out of the training of most professionals. And I, you know, I read Janet's original work, and I realized we knew more about dissociation in 1900 than we did in 1970. And dissociation is critical to understanding internal working models. So I'm going to start with that lens and then let Lee take it from the other direction. And that this pathological dissociation is related to disorganized attachment. And it represents a distortion of the core self processes. There is a sense of defectiveness and self-criticism and hostility 
So a person comes in, you know, a client came in yesterday and said, I, I want to kill myself. And I say, why do you want to kill yourself? And he says, because I'm ugly, I'm defective, I'm not very intelligent, I'm not going to really do well in academics, and I have social anxiety around people, and I can't really make it in the world. Now, that has no basis in reality. It's totally delusional. And so, you know, cognitive-based therapists want to say, you know, you're not that, you're not this. And we all know that that's a waste of time. So the question is, when cognitive behavioral therapies fail, what, why is that? And it's affectively tied to limbic experiences. That's how I feel. I know it's not true, but it's how I feel. And so what does one do to take that affect-based belief and begin to do something about it, which is, you know, the $50 million question for psychotherapy. It also is quite grandiose to think that you're the, you know, one person on earth who's that effective. Um, and why is a person that grandiose? Obviously, because they've been abandoned by the critical caretakers. And it's always about neglect more than about abuse. And so one ha has to be able to process neglect in a very different way than they do PTSD trauma. And so what happens then, and this is the key, key feature I want to make, is that there are going to be multiple internal working models in the dissociative process of parts of self who believe one thing at the same time believe the other. So what Dick Schwartz always said with internal thermal systems therapy is, is that all parts are polarized. And for every part that believes one thing, they also believe the opposite, which is, you know, M Marshall Linehan's dialectical concept which is whatever we believe that we also believe the opposite. And so for most people, there's an internal civil war going on between one part that knows that they're defective and another part that knows that they're not defective. One part that feels like they're fat and the other part that knows they're not fat. And that what happens is that the therapist jumps into that and takes the position, you're not fat, you're not stupid, and then activates the opposite end that needs to be defensive and prove you're wrong. And so the important key feature in psychotherapy is to step back from taking that position and allowing the internal work of the polarized dissociative aspects of the system. So Dan Siegel would call that integration. Integration is noticing that there are these subsystems in the brain that are probably limbic in their origins that are highly polarized and getting those polarized parts of self to be able to figure out how to be able to integrate so that the person isn't going two directions at the same time. Why are you laughing? You're doing such a great job. Uh, come on, you can, it's what they disagree with me. <laughs> All right, so there are these segregated and dissociated models of self and the attachment figure that are constructed early in life. And, you know, every child that's abused has to believe that. My mama is perfect and I am defective in order to be able to explain why they're being abused or neglected. And so they're left with these systems where they feel in this core sense of defectiveness in some ways. And so um, the idea is, is that, um, that somehow one has to go back and look at their past without rose colored glasses. And it can sound a little bit like you're blaming parents. And you never are getting into that box. What you're trying to be able to do is have a person reassess objectively what happened to them in their life, how they perceived it, and what the result was, and how these disorganized systems began to unfold in some way, which we call family of origin work. So in doing addictions therapy, the first step is sobriety. The second step is doing family of origin work and beginning to look at things without rose color classes. For that, I'm very fond of doing systemic work. I like bringing the mother in, the father in, the brother, the sister, the aunt, the uncle, and get the pieces of the puzzle. Because to me, like doing therapy is like working crossword puzzles. There are these huge hunks of information being left out of the person's system. And so by interviewing each of these people, I'm getting a different you know, piece of the elephant. And each of them adds an integrated piece to it all. 
And so if I know that, you know, the mother was raped and the father was alcoholic and that they were missing for six months, you know, while the person was age five or, you know, that the mother was in the hospital for a year. These are really radically important pieces of information that I may not be getting that are important to be integrated. And so part of integration is helping the person begin to put the pieces of the narrative together so that it makes sense. Oh, my mother was in the hospital for a year. I wonder what effect that would have on a five-year-old, you know, which is not the blame idea. All right, so then the result of this, where parts of self are disparate or polarized, is called the addictive personality. And so when a person says, I feel empty inside, I feel like there's a hole inside that never could be filled. I feel like um, a lack of, I don't know who I am or you know, what my life is about, that feeling of emptiness that they feel. It's always about the fact that there are parts of self that are split out, unintegrated, they're like black holes and you feel a sense of anxiety. So, you know, I love this idea of how you treat an anxiety disorder. Well, you know, I, I think a lot of these books on treating anxiety don't really understand anxiety because anxiety is the result of disintegration where you feel anxious all the time because, you know, part of you feels one way and part of you feels the opposite way. And you, part of you know certain things and part of you don't know certain things. And so you don't know the mind of self or the mind of others and therefore you know, you're going to be anxious as hell. And so the cure for anxiety is always integration of the self. You agree? Partly. Okay. Uh, the thing I don't disagree with, and you and I always go around and around about this, is the notion of an, of an addictive personality. And um, uh, the way I understand addiction is, first and foremost, it's a neurophysiological disorder. But equally important and, and complementary to that is again it's it's a disorder in self a disorder of self-regulation and when we're talking about all these these splits or autonomous parts one of the things that's important to keep in mind is um, these are all out of one's awareness uh, they're un what, what sometimes we refer to as unconscious um, and they're also stored uh, uh, pre-verbally, so they don't have they don't have the labels to provide a scaffolding for inter integration. So when we're working from an attachment perspective, or we're working uh, affectively, uh, again, there's a much less reliance on on words and much more reliance on internal experience and as a therapist looking for tip-offs or clues um, that that denote those those internal states uh, and then our job is to attune to that market and um, mirror it back to our patient uh, and in doing that, it begins to activate those uh, autonomous split off parts. For those of you who are sort of picking up the conceptual frame here, Lee is coming from a Diana Fosha, Davin Lu, um, a strong idea of being able to work with affect as the key piece of being able to um, repair the self system. Uh, and I'm coming from more of a dissociative states approach and we're blending them together. We meet in the middle, yeah. oftentimes, not always. Um, the other important piece of uh, part of this slide that I wanna emphasize is um, <clears throat> as these uh, splits become uh, dissociated or one doesn't have awareness of it, they, as Mark has indicated here, they become, uh, in a sense, black holes. Um, the way that a, a patient attempts to adapt to that is by layering defense upon defense upon defense. 
uh, and, a, and, a, and a big piece of uh, working uh, affectively is beginning to move those defenses over uh, and uh, using affect as a way of accessing the core self. And that's, that's where the reparative, uh, restorative work uh, occurs in really, really uh, innately wired, powerful ways. All right, so <clears throat> the, you can see these two approaches, whereas in you're doing parts work, you're gonna have the two polarized parts be able to talk with each other and figure out how to live in the same body. Uh, anyway, in a very similar way to a husband and wife or two partners who are living together um, have to figure out how they're all gonna live in the same house when they're quite divergent or polarized. And uh, so the solution is uh, you, you two have a problem and how are you gonna live in the same body? And that's how you do dissociative states work. And beginning this unconscious polarization, bring it into consciousness, you're able to do that. Okay, so moving on, what I want to focus on now is how you treat the disorder of self. And Lee already gave you a preview of coming events, which is that it's going to have something to do with affect work. And I, I picked this picture of a crystal with some beautiful colors in it because. There's this idea that the self system is there for all of us when we're born. And a lot of the work that has to be done with um, these schema that you're born with at birth are there genetically and, and biologically written. And then events and development then causes further differentiation of the cellular structure. And input then either brings color and dimension or you know, keeps it bland and empty. And so you wanna think of the developing self. So the question we're asking ourselves, if, if there's complex trauma, neglect and abuse, uh, and, and the self system feels much like an imposter where the person is trying to be what they perceive others want them to be, and they don't feel any sense of core self, what does one do to be able to facilitate the structure of the crystal? All right, so in this, you begin to see this idea that there are multiple internal working models, um, each of them having impulses for action and capacity to produce behavior. And so, you know, a person might be an executive who is very, um, highly regarded and, you know, what they used to call in the borderline literature, the apparently competent person, while at the same time going out at night and drinking until they get completely wasted and being totally out of control. And if you meet that person, it seems so confusing, like as if they're two different people. That, as Lee said, that so much of this is unconscious one system is cut off from the other. And so it seems consistent to them that they're having these opposites and that they use language as a way of feeling some identity or integration of this in some way. And their defenses then protect them and maintain that system. And so, you know, the typical alcoholic, you know, can go to work, you know, the proverbial Tuesday through Friday and do more work than most people do, you know, as long as you can cope with them being out sick on Monday um, and over function and under function in varieties of ways. What are your thoughts about that? Well, what, what, what comes to my mind is, again, when we talk about um, an internal working model, or we talk about uh, fractured self, uh, and particularly in terms of what you were just discussing, these different uh, uh, partial pieces of self, uh, again, are operate in autonomous ways. They're not integrated. Uh, and so one will 
will click on without any awareness of the other. And in, in working with uh, uh, patients, you see sh shifts constantly between different autonomous, fracture, uh, frac uh, autonomous fractures. Uh, and so when we're working, the way that we work with them is we begin to become curious about the behaviors that reflect those splits and those uh, uh, autonomous um, uh, clicking on, clicking off. And in becoming curious as a therapist and thinking out loud with your patient, they become uh, curious about their own internal experience. And that sets a process uh, in motion of beginning to knit those together in a, in a more cohesive way. But again, it's always this kind of push-pull, always this dance uh, when you're working with somebody between uh, awareness and defensiveness clicking on again. And so it's, it's important to always kind of be aware of that and mark that. Uh, I, I think one of the big mistakes <clears throat> therapists make uh, is they move too quickly. Uh, they get they get anxious and uh, they get too far ahead of not only themselves but the person they're working with. And one of the important things and skill sets that you need to pick up when you're working effectively with a patient um, is to slow down. Uh, and again, we can understand this as midbrain to midbrain um, stuff. If you s slow down and calm and provide a, a, a calming structure, that has a direct effect on their midbrain functioning. Uh, and we've got you know really good data to support that. It sounds kind of esoteric, but in fact, there's tremendously good data to support that. Um, and in in doing that over and over and over again, there begins to be a change in the defensive structure and uh, that begins to become uh, less needed and the patient comes to rely on core self more and more and more. What do you think? Well, I think this piece, the, de the defense system piece needs some elaboration in the sense that when a person comes in, I'm trying to get some measurement of cravings. And it, that's important because what's going on in their bodies, oftentimes they're unconscious of, and oftentimes their triggers go from zero to 10, and they, there's no modulator of what's five, six, and seven. And so it, when a person is slipping or is moving towards relapse or having high cravings, that's oftentimes an indicator of something good in the therapy, not something bad. And what that means to me is, is that you're beginning to find the inconsistencies. But they oftentimes they'll go to 12-step work, they feel structure, they're working their program, they're doing all the right things. And so they feel like they're on the right road, but you're not getting to the very core issues that are underneath that until something gets activated, which you'll notice by having cravings. And those cravings are always a door or a window into your next piece of work. So if you have a disorder of self, you know, what Lee and I were talking about is that oftentimes these are gender related and we get beat up for making that distinction because it sounds like we're being biased or bigoted. But so much of the sense of self, our culture, develops around the male is around performance, uh, money, and success. Whereas the disorder of self around females are so much around appearances and attractability. And so when a person says, I don't know who I am, you know, there's a tendency to want to step in and begin to help that crystal develop by you know, somehow looking at the cultural definitions of these. Personally, I like doing a certain amount of work on helping the person figure out aspects of self. 
And so I have like a, a sheet where I look at their values and there's like, you know, maybe 90 values that, on that sheet and help them sort out what are their values because they don't even know that they are unique and extraordinary in how they think and feel. And I like beginning to do some active work on beginning to fill in the emptiness of who am I and how do I see myself and what's important to me. So on the male-female continuum, we don't even know our own biases and bigotry and realize that, you know, because I only make $40,000, I feel like I'm defective and a failure. And, you know, that has many layers to it. I think this is an important slide. And, and this is from uh, a friend and colleague, Daniel Brown, uh, who's one of the leading uh, researchers in the attachment, uh, attachment repair uh, field. Uh, and he says, in a good enough child parents caregiving system, the child repeatedly experiences the caregiver's soothing, affect modulating responses. And that's what I was talking about a little while ago. This is, this is midbrain to midbrain stuff uh, that is powerful, but nonverbal. As the child rep child's representational capacity matures, he or she is able to sustain an internal representation of the caregiver's soothing function for longer and longer duration. And I think what Dan is talking about there, again, this is a very developmentally loaded model. Um, and what we're talking about oftentimes uh, when we talk about stuck points, we're talking about uh, uh, developmental delays uh, very early on uh, at the uh, uh, individ individuation phase of development. Uh, the child is uh, misattachment is not supported. Uh, and primarily through through this, they're not supported uh, to individuate and separate, which then allows them to go and explore more and more. Now, in order to do that, if a child doesn't have uh, consistent, positive, affirming uh, caregiving, where the primary caregiver is taking the light in who they are, that uh, that interferes with the capacity to begin to develop um, a, a cohesive sense of self that you can rely on, that you can have confidence in uh, to go and explore the world. Uh, and that also provides the framework or anchor points for affective development, cognitive development, uh, and, and interpersonal skills. So it's very, very simple developmentally. Um, you want to add to that? Well, you can think of it as an, an example, like let's say you're going through a divorce and you know it, it brings up abandonment in such a core kind of way and you feel terrified and overwhelmed. And so you come into the therapist's office and that's probably the time when psychotherapy is most effective because you're in a state of shock and you're at, you're attachment system is way activated. You know, you remember the idea of there are shields up and shields down. Your shields are way up and the attachment system is activated and you're hyper vigilant, hyper aware. And at that point, you know, the therapist is soothing, calming, and is able to reassure you that what you're experiencing is normal. And you, there are lots of things that you can anticipate in this uh, rodeo that you're running. And when you go through those stages, that you're going to come out the other side and you're going to be okay. But all that affective work and self soothing work, you know, if you've never had it before in your life, it's brand new stuff. And you're allowing them to eventually practice and get out there and find new relationships and uh, begin to, to feel effective and powerful and confident. But it, it's that need to come in on a once or twice a week basis where you're holding the person that is what psychotherapy is mostly about. And I, and I think what this slide kind of depicts uh, 
therapeutically is this is the stance uh, that is important for us as therapists to assume when we're working with people. Um, and what that, what that metaphorically allows to happen is it begins to create in a sense a reset developmentally. Uh, and uh, relative to that reset process, rep, uh, repair uh, kicks in and there's a profound change in self structure. So let me do this piece then, which is that um, there's a book that highly influenced me along the way by Stanley Greenspan called um, Structurally Based Psychotherapy. And in it, it's developmentally based psychotherapy. And you know, Stanley Greenspan is at NIH and is a child psychiatrist. And he really has a lot of interesting things to say because he studies children. And he convinced me that all therapists need to be child therapists because it's understanding these structures that occur developmentally that need to be repaired. And so what he does is he delineates what these structures are. And so I realized that the missing piece in trauma therapy is that we're not fully understanding what happens at age two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, that is not happening when there is neglect or complex trauma. And if we could conceptualize those, that some of these would become the targets of good psychotherapy. So the metacognitive people are beginning to recognize that. And metacognitive based psychotherapies, which Fonagy is you know, one of the leaders of the field, and Bateman and others from Menninger, that what they're recognizing are what I'm going to call these structural deficits. And of course, Marsha Lanahan got that too when she talked about DBT. There were a lot of pieces in that she added. And so I just take some of Greenspan's concepts, and I, I know this is dense, but I'm going to take each sentence one by one. There's a good reason to believe that large segments of the population lack critical capacities such as self-observing abilities. And so an example of that would be, um, I know I'm defective and I'm never going to be okay. And the, that's a self-observing capacity where the person is not seeing themselves in, through any mirror that um, is reasonable. And that um, these capacities can be called structural capacities, as he says, and they make up the stage in which the psychological drama. Yeah. So verbal based therapies miss some of these structural deficits. But let's go to the next one. So then what he delineates is that they have one self-regulation, which we have been talking about, which is impulse control and you know, going from zero to 10 really quickly which you can see with you know, young children impulse control problems. Relating, which is how to be able to interact with other people if you've been teased cruelly in school and people are, are seen as untrustworthy and unsafe, how can you possibly relate? If you feel like you're defective as a human being, how can you think other people are gonna like you? And then pre-symbolic affect communication, which is, what signals are you giving out to other people that say, come closer, go away? And why nobody likes you has something to do with what you're communicating on verbally. And uh, being enough in their body that they could see nuances because there's been no one attuned to them along the way to reflect back what they're putting out to people. And then representing different ways and experiences through self observation, meaning that when you're feeling rageful to stop and ask yourself what's getting activated inside and what from the past is coming up in the present. And finally bonding and how you block out people from connecting with you. And so, so much of what we see is maybe the latter stages of therapy with the addict is their inability to allow another person to connect to them that they bounce off any real attachments and connections. And so they look like they're married or in relationship, but in actuality, it's all false self and it's a role that they're playing 
um, and they're not really allowing the other person to love them. And so if you break it down into these components, you can see them developmentally and how they might be lacking in certain ways. And how do you teach somebody who is blocking themselves from loving how to be able to love or to be loved, you know, is the question. That this slide then summarizes all that I've already said. So let me just read it one more time, which is that, that how does one build the ego structure of attention, mood, maintaining and negotiating relationships, understanding the intentions of self and others? This is metacognitive therapy. Metacognitive therapy is knowing the mind of self and the mind of others. And it's much more complicated than we've ever thought of it. How does one learn to represent feelings, affect, and wishes that have never been represented before to build bridges between the past, present, and future? How does one work on increasing the depth of intimacy and relatedness and that deadness and hollowness inside us? Um, how does one deal with issues of merging and separation and individuation, uh, which there's no verbal or representational analog in the patient's personality? Isn't that beautiful the way he, he articulates that? I mean, I, you know, it's like for me, I like kind of doing a, a real look at what we do in psychotherapy. And the more I can begin to tighten that up and understand what, what our goals are, what we're trying to do and what we're accomplishing, it allows me to delineate the deficits that the individual presents. And then I get clarity of what it is that I'm trying to do with my various interventions. And I, I think this one slide says it better than anything else I've ever seen. And, and this is really, um, even though there's tremendous data supporting all of these notions, uh, this also really reflects what, in my opinion, is the art of doing psychotherapy. And psychotherapy is, in my opinion, in my experience, is very much uh, an art-based skill. Now we use data to kind of understand what we do, but in the in the throes of it, it it's really a creative, dynamic process that uh, both you and your patient experience together. Um, and I think this kind of reflects that in a very elegant way. So let's take that a person who says that they cannot allow themselves to be loved, and they're in a marriage and their partner adores them and loves them, is securely attached, but they're avoidant and they bounce it back. What does one do to allow a person to be able to um, allow themselves to be loved? That's a great question. Um, and again, I think where I would start to work with that is um, looking for the affective markers that denote that avoidant uh, uh, attachment system that they've acquired. Um, and then use that as a, as we often talk about here, affect becomes the trailhead. Um, just like when you go hiking, there's that initial sign at the beginning of the trail that let you know you're on the right course. Well, affect operates the same way. And as you begin to use that as the material that you work with, um, you're able to begin to trace down into whatever developmental stuck points there are with that individual. Um, so I'm going to spend a lot of time initially uh, uh, working with them that way and with the, with the idea of engaging some reparative uh, uh, processes first. That, so it's very much, in, at least in my opinion, uh, it's very much internal work um, and not uh, so much may, maybe taking a look at uh, interactions in reality because it's, it's, it's the internal experience that's driving all all this stuff. So if somebody's avoidant, it's the internal map that drives that that we have to begin to engage 
and begin to reprocess. So in a sense, uh, you have to do the internal work uh, and develop a sense of me uh, before you can uh, engage somebody else in a, uh, uh, a positive relationship. Otherwise, it becomes simply uh, adaptations through false self. All right. So Lee and I are going to disagree on this. Oh, no. And you can watch us disagree, which is that I think he takes that position because the field has gone too much the other direction and try to work with the interaction between people. And it's more interpsychic and he's more intrapsychic. I take the position that there are three sources of change. One is an inside job of where one learns how to be able to repair itself. Second is the relationship between the client and the therapist, where one learns how to be able to uh, be attuned to and reactive to being attuned to in a sense that we've been talking about throughout the rest of the workshop in repair. And then third is if they happen to have a partner who's securely attached, that becomes a third source of repair. And so I like using all three resources simultaneously. And if you have, you have to do it in some balance. And so, yeah, the first step I think is it's an inside job and beginning to work internally. And then second is the relationship with the therapist. And that has to be looked at uh, and uh, in a crucial kind of way. And then the third part is what you do with the couple. And so I find that if somebody loves you unconditionally, like let's say, for example, I have a client who's a sex addict and has had done a lot of terrible things as a sex addict, but his wife loves him unconditionally, understands the origins and knows it's really not about her, it's about him. And she is there, you know, bringing the sun in every day of her love of being able to say, even though you're imperfect, I adore you. And in that, he is going to fight her in a variety of ways in a defensive posture until he can begin to let the sun in and allow her love to begin to heal him. And so I think there's a lot of healing that goes in to having a secure attachment. And so probably the very best thing a person can do with disorganized attachment is find a partner who's securely attached and let them slowly uh, uh, allow themselves to be loved and cared for, you know, by, you know, pushing against it for a while until they find out that the person's going to stay there, even though uh, they're imperfect. So guess what? You agree. I agree with that. Just, uh, I go about it a little bit, a little bit differently. Um, but no, I essentially agree in that. I, I would, the thing I would embellish from the, in terms of what you said is the, the therapeutic relationship becomes uh, it becomes an experiment, and uh, and it's the experiences of doing something a little bit differently and relationally that begin to turn this stuff around. Um, so I, you know, I think that's kind of the in my mind that's probably the most important factor in all of this. Now, of course, uh, again, I believe that uh, attachment repair is an internal, it's an inside job. Uh, and I think we would agree with that. Now, there, you know, there are two ways that people can change an attachment disorder. Um, and probably the way most people in my mind uh, uh, begin to address that is as we just said, they, they become involved with somebody who is securely attached that provides them with that uh, safety and uh, attunement that they uh, didn't get. And I think probably most people uh, accidentally or on purpose kind of go through that process and they just do, do just fine. 
Now, the other way that you change an attachment problem is a therapeutic relationship. Well, let's say something about that. I, I think the problem in this world is there's, there's not enough people who are securely attached to be able to help heal. And so I think that's where the 12 step work comes in because I, I think Absolutely. that because we can't, you know, most people who are addicts do not pick securely attached partners. And so it, it, they end up making the problem worse rather than better in, re, through repetition and reenactment. And so what you hope for is that not only do they get, you know, they say it, 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 it takes a, a community, that you have a community of people who care about you unconditionally. So you say, I slipped this week, and then people say, you know, hi, Joe, and, and care about you unconditionally. And then two, that you have a good enough sponsor that's further enough in their own work that is there and to provide unconditional secure attachment. And, you know, of course, you can't always choreograph that. But of all the things that I, I wish for, and I'm starting to see a client, this is that they find a sponsor um, who can provide that for them. And I think, uh, again, not to jump too far ahead, but I, I, I think the 12-step uh, process, um, addiction recovery as a process, uh, is very much reflective of the things that we're talking about because it has to do with uh, learning to relate not only to others in a meaningful, positive way, which is the fellowship, but it's also learning to relate internally, uh, which is the uh, uh, individual four step uh, onward stuff that uh, allow a person to begin to also uh, move into acceptance with what goes on in, inside of them. So it's, it's, a, it, it's a very, very powerful attachment-based process. It says, how likely or often does it happen that a person with disorganized attachment establishes a committed relationship um, with someone who's securely attached? And you anticipated what I'm saying, which is that uh, it's rare but when it happens, like, thank the Lord. Yeah. Snowball's chance. But it does happen. Yeah, it does happen. Okay. So to summarize, then, the hallmark of secure attachment is the ability to reflect on one's internal emotional experience, to make sense of it, and to reflect on the mind of the other. And that is called mentalizing. And um, the mentalizing kind of therapies is beginning to uh, look at one's internal experience. I mean, I use, for example, eating disorder. The client with an eating disorder comes in and says, I'm fat, that if I eat this piece of cherry pie, that I'm going to become uh, obese and out of control, and that nobody uh, is going to like me or love me ever because of my weight. And it, it's kind of a perfect example of a disorder of self because the calories and the weight and the food become in an obsessive way, the way to feel control and safe and to not deal with all the things that are underlie it. And so it is truly a form of, avo of avoidance, which is what OCD is really. And so, in order to break that up, you know, what a lot of eating disorder therapists do is, you know, again, cognitive behavioral work. And that's always the first step, you know, and get them to eat the food or not to binge or purge and all that kind of thing. But the depth work is looking at the layers of all the good reasons why the person is unable to see themselves in the mirror accurately. And, it, you know, you can't any, any better example of that. And you know, they think that when other people see them, they're saying, oh, that person's ugly because they're fat and I'm not going to like them. And, you know, so, you know, the, the million dollar question with an eating disorder, what are you afraid will happen if you eat food? And the person says, I'll spend my life alone. Now, look at that. What will happen if I eat food? I will spend my life alone. Well, how does one go from that to that? It has to make some sense in some way. And that's the internal worth model. 
So you see it so clearly with, with something like that. But what's so interesting about working with CD is that we tend to think of eating disorder and CD as so different, but actually, you know, they're much more similar than they are different. Because, you know, what does the alcohol do? The alcohol, you know, becomes their identity. I'm an alcoholic. And, you know, the reason I get up every day is to drink. And if they're going to give up that identity, then who are they? Same goddamn question. Yeah. And with it, and I agree with you, by the way, I think there, there's tremendous overlap between dis eating disorders and uh, other addictions. Um, and I, I think what happens in an in addictive disease, one of the powerful drivers uh, is that your drug of choice uh, becomes a very, very powerful, reliable, consistent self-object that allows you to do what you could not do otherwise. And that is regulate the discomfort that you experience internally. Uh, and so it's, it's learning, sobriety is about learning to not avoid uh, our inter internal experience, but to do exactly what's stated uh, in line number one there. Uh, what we replace that with is the ability to reflect on one's internal emotional experience. Uh, resentment's a very, very good example of that. Uh, in uh, addiction, resentment kind of drives a system. Um, if we look at it traditionally, and it's avoidance of dealing with resentment that keeps us stuck. Uh, but as we develop the ability to begin to reflect on what uh, our emotional experience is, that begins to be, uh, that be begins to transform. Uh, and we move from resentment to uh, compassion, not only self-compassion, but compassion with our, with our, with our peers. Oh, this is good. All right. So. What I've tried to do is, you know, as I said in the last workshop, I was trained in the adult attachment therapy by Mary Main and her folks. And um, I, I love that work because it changed my lens by which I do most of my therapy. And one of the key features then of moving towards secure attachment is dealing with idealization and family loyalties. There's always defense whenever you begin to deal with family of origin stuff. And so you don't wanna take a position of uh, in one extreme because you'll pull out the polarization of the other extreme. And you want the person to be able to do the work inside rather than um, you get caught in the middle of it. But the number one block to secure attachment is family loyalty. And your need to, to come back and see things through rose-colored glasses. The person did the best they could, I forgive them. It's all oftentimes premature. And what one has to do is get to the anger and figure out what to do with the anger over the neglect and the abuse. Because you go from anger to passive aggressive to turning it against yourself and when those don't work, the question is, how does one deal with the anger that is the residue of neglect? And how does one sort that out internally and not turn it against themselves? A lot of therapy is oriented around that. In that, you're beginning to do, get more clarity about self and be able to say that if it was my child, would I have reacted in that way and is it acceptable that i would you know if i bring a five-year-old that the things that were done and said to me were done to a five-year-old and when that happens it's like an egg beater in the head and it begins to change that internal experience we have a client now who says i don't love anybody i don't think i'm capable of loving anybody um, I don't love myself, and so I don't really think I love my children. And so 
he said that maybe two weeks ago. And now he's coming in and he's interacting with his children in a totally different way, enjoying the hell out of it, feeling the love of his children um, and feeling loved by his children. Now, how the hell did that happen in two weeks is the question I'm asking myself. And it has to do with what we're talking about today, which is really looking seriously at many of the events that occurred in his life that he thought were kind of normal and recognizing and saying, shit, I would never do that with my own kids. You know, how could anybody allow it to happen? So this week he went home to his mother and he said, you know, something like, how could you have allowed dad to do that to us? And I thought, oh my God, you know, where is that coming from? And, you know, he and the mom sat down and had the first real talk of their lives. And it's just powerful stuff that's happening internally. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> uh, um, Mark, Mark feels that idealization of family loyalties is maybe the, the pivot point in this work, I, you know, I think it's the the, the next line down. Uh, I think it's the ability to acknowledge and in, engage and actively process loss um, and addicted disease. Uh, experientially, is very much about loss, and one of the I think the the stuck points are, uh, in early recovery is the reluctance to begin to acknowledge those and deal with them, uh, along with shame. Uh, and what this, this process is about, there, again, there's this push-pull between over-defensiveness, which allows one to avoid those feelings, uh, and uh, experiencing loss and aloneness and shame. And the, the better uh, we become at dealing with those things, the less we need to rely on defensiveness. And the more we begin to experience feeling real in terms of core self. You wanna comment on that? Yeah, makes sense. Do you wanna check, uh, do we wanna check questions or comments? Are there any? We will do that next. I want to just say one more thing about this slide, which okay. is the, the coherent narrative is really, it seems so obvious, but let me just tell you what it means to me. A person wants to kill themselves. And it's their job to excavate and figure out what happened to them from the day they were born to today when he wants to kill themselves that made them get to the point where they couldn't live in this world. And that's a coherent narrative. It has to make total sense that anybody who's lived a life like you live would want to be able to kill themselves. Now, we want to say, oh, they're depressed or they're bipolar. But I've not met a depressed or bipolar client that didn't have a coherent narrative that somehow entitled them to feel as desperate and lonely as they do. And it's their job to come up with beginning to put the pieces of that puzzle together. And the therapist's job is to facilitate that process and giving them ownership of that work. And I think a, 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 a really powerful way that this works in uh, addiction recovery, and, and I absolutely agree with that. Um, one of the end products of this kind of work is developing a cohesive narrative that one can use to describe what they experience. And the way we get that in recovery is when we tell our story. Um, and it's not only the telling of the tale that's important, but it's the response we get from the uh, people uh, at the meeting level that we tell our story to, that begins to change things in this narrative in a really, really powerful way. And uh, one of the key factors in, in, in that process, recovery-wise, is realizing that what you think are you know, things you've done that are, are totally unique and outrageous, a, a number of other people have too. And they're just sitting there looking at you, nodding their heads going, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. 
And that, that in and of itself is very reparative. There's a question about working with children in foster care who are continually getting the experience of insecure attachment yeah. by their bio parents. And what I would say about that is that, that the central question that I ask a person with PTSD is what did that child need to hear at the time to help make sense of what was going on? Tell them now what they needed to hear back then. And so if you have a child that's in an abusive environment, you become that person. And because there's one person on the planet that can help them accurately interpret what's going on around them and help them understand it's not because they're bad or deserve it, that changes everything potentially. And so you begin to realize your importance as you know, really the only uh, source of, of healing. And you know, what you're doing is pure prevention. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also in doing that, you know, it, it, in a sense, this is also about developing a coherent meaning to the experiences that you have. Uh, and, the, and the better able you to, uh, the better able you are to do that, um, in a, and particularly when you can do that within the confines of a caring, supportive, empathic relationship, uh, that become those become important anchor points to deal with to deal with uh, adversive experiences. So we've talked about affect, we've talked about self system, and in that self system, what we want to be able to do is help the person recognize their internal thoughts and feelings, which is, you know, going from dissociation to beginning to be in their bodies and in their minds, and then beginning to um, have that so that they can do the internal work. So for example, let's say Lee says to me something like, well, Mark, I, you know, I thought that you were kind of off in that lecture yesterday. And let's say then I respond to that with rage and, you know, want to beat him up. Well, I then have to do my internal work and say, I wonder what it is that Lee said that's activating all that nastiness inside of me. And so I have to know that I'm enraged and then I have to become curious about why I'm enraged. And then I need to be able to respond to him and be able to say, I thought that was a little insensitive or whatever the hell I want to say. But it's a three-step process. And if you think about you know, structural capacities, you know, where does one get that? Or if one has bipolar disorder, you know, they go from zero to 10 so quickly, you know, how can they possibly do that? So what you're doing is in the differentiation of self is to recognize that, that when you have these strong internal feelings, that one has to be able to be present, not dissociated and to notice what you're feeling, to be able to have a vocabulary to be able to put that to, which a lot of men don't, and then to be able to do the hard work of struggling with what that brings up. So what do you do with all that anger is the question I asked earlier um, about all the neglect and abuse in your life. And that is, first of all, to be aware of it, and second of all, to be able to struggle with it and be able to sort out what is about the present, what is about the past. And most of the times when a person is feeling out of control, it's about the past, not about the present. And so teaching them how to be able to separate past and present and being able to sort out who they're really angry at and why they're misdirecting it if they are. Yeah. And I think one of the, the most common stuck points in the folks that we work with and we see folks with really complex uh presenting problems um uh, but i think that, that one of the cardinal things that we work with uh from the beginning is they literally do not know their own thoughts their own feelings and their own desires 
uh, and when you ask them, um, uh, they look at you nonplussed, like, what are you talking about? You're speaking Greek. And so we spend a lot of time beginning to help them develop a, a sense of uh, their own wants and needs. Um, What says how about this? Well, it's all about boundaries. It's, it's all about it it's all about the boundaries. <laughs> and you can't and without a without a cohesive sense of self uh, as an anchor point, um, it's awfully challenging to have uh, to, to 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 develop effective boundaries, both in terms both internally and with others. Um, and when we don't have when we don't have established boundaries, uh, then it's hard to know where our experience ends and others' experiences begin. And we, uh, in a metaphorical sense, we become lost. Um, but as one develops a more cohesive sense of self, one of the things we're able to do is to delineate between me and important others. Yeah, sometimes it's so simple. Maybe the hardest thing for the trauma survivor is the word yes and the word no. They seem so obvious to the rest of us. Yes, I wanna go, no, I don't. But it, they're very complicated terms because when they've said no in the past, no one's listened. And so they don't bother to speak up anymore. And then they feel totally out of control. And when they say yes, oftentimes, so, you know, like I dealing a lot as many of you are with people who are having sex, you know, online or with sex with people who are strangers or sex, with, you know, anonymously. And it's always about yes and no. They think that, um, that when they have a feeling of loneliness and need connection, they need to say yes. And then as soon as they do, they regret it and wish they had said no. And they're reenacting and repeating what happened early in life where when they said yes, nobody listened to them. And when they said no, nobody listened to them. And so, it, it, you know, to even begin to start that out, you have to go back to basics and teach them, you know, what it means to be able to have boundaries and be able to say yes when they want something and no when they don't. So when we're dealing with the addict, we're also having to look at the perception of the other and being able to know what's in the mind of others. And so um, that in couples therapy, you know, we teach people communication. But, you know, the key aspect of communication is empathy. And empathy is a very complex concept because in empathy, it means that you don't intentionally hurt other human beings. And that becomes a code that you live by. And that means that you do not have permission to take the person you love the most and hurt them the most. And so, if those are the two guiding principles, then being able to recognize that when you say or do certain things that are impulsive or reactive or filled with hate and anger or project past anger on the person that you're living with, that that is totally unacceptable. And that it hurts you when you're hurting somebody else you love. That is so complex, isn't it? Um, a large part of what we do is metacognitively based. Um, and that's a really hard concept to kind of wrap your mind around. You read uh, Fonagy and the folks that are really, um, really basing what they do on that. It, it, it's a real mind twister. Um, but simply put, uh, metacognition is the ability to reflect on what goes on in your mind uh, and the ability to, uh, to make reasonable guesses about what goes on in other people's minds. 
So uh, in one way, it's as it says in the slide, it's, it's learning to think about one's thinking. It's learning to step back and kind of take the bigger picture. And what you get along with it that's so important is the ability to reflect uh, on internal experience. And I think that, uh, we spend a lot of time, uh, particularly at the group level in our, in our program, uh, addressing uh, uh, metacognitive, what we call metacognitive errors. And, you know, a, a really very, very common example of that is somebody does a piece of work in group and the response that they get is, oh, I know exactly how you feel. Well, it sounds really good and it's it, it, on the surface, it sounds empathic and compassionate. But if you, if you take a moment to think about it, how does one possibly know exactly what goes on inside of somebody's, somebody else? So what I will, I will do in that situation is invite the person to, rather than make a global statement like that, uh, you know, I might spin it just a little bit. Well, in what way do you feel that you're most like what goes on inside of the person you're talking about, uh, and it's those it's those little those little tweaks that begin to jumpstart the ability to reflect, uh, not only on self but to reflect on others. You want to add to that? Yeah. Again, I think this is really understated because when therapists go into group therapy, oftentimes they think of it like teaching because there is a strong cognitive teaching component to therapy. And so they're going in, I'm going to teach them DBT or something of that sort. But the truth is, is that, that group therapy is sometimes a necessary piece of work that is for people to get better. When I'm doing private practice and I don't have the, the group working with me, uh, I don't sometimes feel like I can help the person get fully better. So the reason I love what we do is because we have you know, several hours of group each day and individual therapy combined. And then in that group therapy, what we have to do is teach the therapist how to be able to have the clients benefit from being in the group by listening to what the other person's agendas are and beginning to have an internal experience around that and to think about one's thinking. What does that bring up in you what is it, you know, what is your level of empathy? Um, what is your level of connection to it? And what they oftentimes will say is, I don't feel close to anybody. I don't feel like I have a problem with anybody. I feel like I'm, you know, th their problem is different than my problem. And of course, that is their problem. And so it's beginning to allow that process to break down and be able to allow connection between them and others that the group therapy experience is about. So these are the pieces of it. And so what we do in the group therapy process, you know, is metacognitive mastery, which is mind of self, mind of others, and a beginning to reflect inside and on the basis of that decide on some constructive action. You know, the, the, what I keep finding in, in my groups is that it's the last step that is the hardest even if they get metacognitive masteries, they don't seem to be able to use their internal states to take constructive problem-solving action. There's such a strong sense of learned helplessness that they don't get that for every problem, there's a solution. And that sometimes you need to be patient and work with it and get clarity, but it's beginning that struggle to figure that out and then to put certain steps into action. And so I run aftercare group and every week in aftercare group, every one per person makes a commitment to action. And it's that commitment to action that drives it. And I find the aftercare now, you know, an essential component of what we're doing because we're taking what we started and beginning to put it in motion and getting them to see that they can have mastery and solve problems in a creative way that they thought were unsolvable internally and externally. Yeah, I, yeah. It sounds 
really, really complicated. It's, again, I think it's actually very simple. And, and one of the ways you can facilitate uh, uh, self-reflection, being able to uh, mentalize more effectively uh, is by just simply, first of all, as a therapist, assuming a stance of extreme curiosity. Uh, to genuinely be curious about what your patient's experiencing, what they're feeling, what they're thinking, um, and to be able to convey that to them, that you really are genuinely curious about, uh, about what they experience internally. And conversely, the way you begin to encourage uh, patients to do that is to encourage them to be curious curious not only about their own internal experience, but on the group level, for example, to become curious about uh, what they imagine goes on with their peers, and then to use that as a conduit uh, uh, to uh, begin to relate to others. There's a statement that when you say something like, I know just how you feel, it takes the focus in the original statement of that person to the one responding to, I know just. And you are absolutely right. Right. Yeah, and very, very well, very well put. It's, it, uh, there is a, an element of uh, diverting that goes into that. It's, it's, sort, it's a very powerful way to uh, avoid, you know, to avoid and, and interdict the process going deeper. Uh, so it's always important to pay uh, critical attention to those things and not only pay attention to them, but to confront them. Uh, well, actually teach. I mean, you have to teach the people how to respond yeah. in an effective way rather yeah. than confront it and show why what they're doing is not effective. And so there's just a lot that goes into cognitive or into group therapy and making it an internal depth experience um, and an affective experience. And so uh, what we want is our groups to be affectively based and the, what the clients keep doing is wanting to make them cognitive based. And so it's our ability to be able to do that as part of the mentalizing process. So, and I want to add to that, that it's the, it's the affect piece that becomes the, the channel to connect with others. So when somebody says, I really know how you feel, um, what you want to do with that is invite them, you know, okay, uh, top of the list, what's the thing you feel most uh, as you listen to so-and-so? Um, and that becomes, it sounds trite, but it becomes extremely powerful because it's encouraging uh, the respondent to drop down into, into core self and to communicate that and to share it and to have it begin to develop a shared experience with others, uh, which again is another very important factor in change. Okay, we're an hour and a half is up again. And wow. uh, oh, wow. the, I know we didn't get through it all, but you know, the, the truth is I don't think I wanted to get through it all. I, I want us to have a dialogue and a discussion. I mean, some of the things Lee and I talked about today, we've never said to each other. And um, I, I just wanted us to have that interesting experience with you. So I hope you all um, find it helpful. And <clears throat> I hope that um, if you have thoughts uh, about any of this, that you'll write to us and we'll write back to you. And uh, we really appreciate you attending and being part of all this. And uh, uh, if you have disagreements about anything, we'd like to hear that too. Thank you all. Have a good day. Hey, thank you.